Good evening, everyone. It really is a pleasure to welcome you tonight to the first of this year's program sponsored by the Friends of the Asian Art at the Walters Art Museum. This group has, over the decades, contributed inestimably to the life and legacy of the museum. And during that time, as a group, you have come together with the curators to augment through purchases, gifts, and knowledge the Walters world-renowned collections of Asian art. Through a shared passion for all things Asia, and I mean Asia in the broadest sense, from the Eastern Mediterranean to the Pacific, the members of the Friends of Asian Art have developed a deep sense of affection for the museum and its collections, and also for each other. Without further delay, I'll hand it over, I'll hand it over to Ellie Hughes, our Deputy Director for Art and Program, and she'll introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Annie Proser. This is Annie's debut at the Walters in her new role, and I hope that this will be just the beginning of her long relationship with you, the Friends of Asian Art. Thank you. Over to you, Ellie. Thank you, Julia. Adriana Proser is our Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. John Quincy Scott Curator of Asian Art at the Walters Art Museum. She holds a PhD in Chinese Art and Archaeology from Columbia University, and she was Assistant Curator of East Asian Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. For 16 years prior to joining the Walters, she was the John H. Foster Senior Curator at the Asia Society Museum. She has organized and co-organized more than 40 exhibitions featuring diverse works from all over Asia. At Asia Society, she served as the in-house and co-curator for such exhibitions as The Art of Impermanence, Japanese Works from the John C. Weber Collection and Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III Collection, and Pilgrimage and Buddhist Art. Her many publications include Buddha and Shiva Lotus and Dragon, Masterworks from the Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III Collection at Asia Society. With particular relevance to this evening's program, she worked with Sylvia Fraser Liu and Donald Stadner to curate the 2015 Asia Society International Loan Exhibition, Buddhist Art of Myanmar, and was contributor to the associated catalog co-published by Asia Society and Yale University Press. Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Annie as we know her for tonight's talk. Over to you, Annie. Thank you so much, Ellie, and uh, thank you, Julia. And I really want to thank uh, all the friends of Asian art and and everyone else who is um, tuning in to to hear this talk tonight. It's uh, just a delight to be here, and I'm really excited uh, about my new role at at the Walters. I um, I want to start this. Uh, evening speaking a little bit about the title of this talk because somebody already wrote in to um, ask about the use of some terminology so let me just define that and uh, um, the, the word Myanmar uh, derives from um, Myanmar which has been a term that's been in use since the 12th century or earlier in 1989, the government formally replaced Burma, which had been the standard English language version um, of the name for the country during the British period. <clears throat> Yet both names have been used alongside for centuries, and they are used interchangeably by citizens uh, in that country still today. So while I'm mostly going to use the term Myanmar when I uh, speak tonight, I will occasionally be using Burma as well. This evening, I'm going to touch on myth, history, and craftsmanship to help uh, contextualize a few Burmese works that are in the collection of the Walters Museum of Art. During Myanmar's Kongbang period from 1752 to 1885, a myth developed that the dynastic lines descended from the family of the Buddha on the Indian subcontinent. There are numerous myths in Myanmar's various regions that tie the Buddha or relics of the Buddha to Myanmar. One relates to the famous Shwedagon Pagoda in Yangon, previously known as Rangoon, According to this legend, 
the pagoda, the Shwedagon pagoda, enshrines eight hair relics given by the Buddha to two brothers named Tapusa and Balika. The legend is recorded on stone panels that date to the last quarter of the 15th century. The root of the tale comes from the Pali Canon's mention of two brothers who presented the Buddha with food offerings, but received nothing from the Buddha in return. Later commentaries mention that the Buddha gave the brothers eight hair relics in exchange. While the brothers were first said to be from Ukala in India, the Shwedagon inscription associates them with uh, Suvana Bhumi in lower Myanmar. The inscription relates that two hairs were stolen by a snake king and two others were lost by a greedy king returning to Myanmar, to Myanmar from India. Nevertheless, King Okalapa performed a miracle and restored the four missing hairs. While many Buddhist stories, particular to Myanmar, have emerged over time, established Buddhist stories like those about the past lives of the Buddha, known as Jataka tales, have remained popular in Myanmar along with the rest of the Buddhist world. Jataka stories are the frequent subject of temple paintings, carvings, and imagery on functional objects. <clears throat> the most popular set of Jataka stories in Southeast Asia is from the Pal Pali Kanon and compri comprises 547 tales. Each story poses a moral challenge where virtue is justly rewarded, underscoring the law of Kama, as it is known in Pali or Karma uh, in Sanskrit. In each of these past lives, the Buddha embodies exemplary behavior based on one or a combination of 10 virtues, generosity, morality, forbearance, vigor, meditation, wisdom, skill and means, conviction, strength, and knowledge. Among the most frequently depicted is the Buddhidatta Jataka, Jataka number 543, and one of the last 10 uh, that deals with the previous lives of the Buddha. So um, you're looking here on the screen at wooden chests with scenes of the Bodhidatta Jataka. Um, this is from the Walters collection and it is lacquered uh, and gilded. In this Jataka, the Buddha's to be has been reborn as a great serpent or Naga and his name is Bodhidatta and Bodhidatta exemplifies the virtue of forbearance. In brief, a greedy Brahmin snake charmer named Alambayana ordained magic, uh, sorry, the Alambayana obtained magic spells from a hermit in order to capture Buridatta, a hunter who in the past was taken by Buridatta to live in, a, in splendor in the serpent kingdom, discloses the great ser serpent's secret meditation place to the snake charmer. So what you're seeing here on the screen, you can see uh, I've enlarged what is uh, that reddish square right there. Um, that's a, a palace scene, a very popular scene that shows um, these uh, serpents um, draping uh, from, <clears throat> from the um, uh, ceilings. Uh, they seem to be draping from, from curtains and from also um, from architectural components there uh, in, in the palace context. <clears throat> Alambayana nabs Buridatta as he's coiled around an anthill so he can achieve fame and wealth. That is uh, Alambayana. I'm talking about who wants to achieve fame and wealth. And then he forces the unfortunate great serpent to perform in marketplaces. 
Though Buridatta finds this whole experience humiliating, he fights off the shame and anger in order to follow the eight great precepts. And eventually he's freed by his brother. On the screen here, again, um, in this area that I've highlighted, you can see Buridatta. Um, there's an arrow pointing towards his head here, which actually looks a bit like a, a dragon's head. So he's a, he's a great Naga. So he has this um, really impressive appearance. And you can see these kinds of kind of um, uh, stylized M-like uh, rows uh, that are behind him. This uh, this is really kind of a stylus a stylistic device for for indicating his his body wrapped around that ant hill. And then above Buridatta's head, you can see the snake charmer who's about to whack him. And according to the myth. Um, the way that he subdues does, uh, Buridatta is to pound him down so that finally he can fit him into a basket and he carries him in that basket place uh, from marketplace to marketplace to, to show him. <clears throat> uh, just a couple other uh, scenes I want to highlight for you here. Um, this is a scene that is related to um, actually the grandfather of Buridatta. Um, the the uh, this Jataka story goes through a number of generations and uh, Buridatta's grandfather actually um, has a, uh, his grandfather was actually human and he has a, a special palace constructed that includes a pool where his children um, who are half serpent can, can play and uh, hang out. And um, one day there's a, a turtle, a tortoise that appears in the pond and you can see it right there with it where the arrow is pointing. Uh, and the children are terrifically frightened. The princes are frightened and uh, their father condemns the tortoise to death. And that's what's going on there. <clears throat> and then here also from another part of the story, we see um, a hunter and his son on the left hand, lower left hand side. And then on the lower right hand side, uh, we see um, a king holding a wish granting um, jewel, uh, which also relates to another part of the story. <clears throat> now, we've been unable to identify all of the scenes on on this chest, but we can tell for sure because of the different parts of the story that we have been able to identify that in fact, the way that this, um, this narrative um, is expressed across the surface of the chest uh, is not at all in, in a historical uh, order or um, in, in order of the actual story. So, um, it's much more, the artists have been much more focused on um, the aesthetics of the whole surface uh, and then making sure that uh, the viewer um, knows exactly how to read the surface. Hopefully they're familiar enough with the story to identify the individual scenes. Lacquered wooden chests like this one would have been used to store sutras, likely in a monastery or Buddhist temple. Manuscripts and scripture chests are among the articles uh, families of monks have traditionally donated to monasteries upon their sons taking tonsure. And of course, um, <clears throat> because it is a Buddhist, uh, Theravada Buddhist state, um, many, many of the sons uh, become monks at least for some point in time in their, in their lives. Let's take a look at how craftspeople achieve the decoration. Burmese lacquer is obtained from the sap, the sap of the uh, Melanoria uh, Ushita, uh, Ushitata tree, which belongs to the uh, Anacardia uh, family and grows in Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Cambodia. The sap is harvested from the tree by tapping and has a straw color, which quickly turns a, glass, a glossy black. 
Its main function is to waterproof and heat proof the object, and it has excellent adhesive properties, as well as good stability in hot, acid, and alkaline conditions. Um, so uh, given the um, heat and humidity of, of, the, of much of the local climate, um, it is a very desirable material or has been a very desirable material uh, for locals to use. The molded relief on the lacquer chest is called Theo. In general, Theo is a thick lacquer paste composed of lacquer resin combined with finely sifted ashes of teak wood sawdust, pulverized bone, rice husks, or cow dung. And it can be prepared from heated lacquer mixed with the pulverized ashes of cow dung and then kneaded into a fine plastic putty with a wax-like consistency. As we've seen in these images of the chest under discussion, this adherent putty has been applied to the exterior of the surfaces of the wooden chest to create two-dimensional relief. Um, <clears throat> Like gold leaf decoration, the relief molded technique may have come to Burma via Thailand, where it's been popular in architectural and furniture decorations. Theo paste is rolled into long spaghetti-like threads, which are lightly sprinkled with fine powdered ash to, pre to prevent sticking. And with the help of an iron stylus, these are arranged from left to right on lacquer coated surfaces like this one, uh, to serve as a guide for the pla placement of the more complex motifs. These more complex motifs may have been first sketched on paper and then lightly etched on onto the surface of the object or for repetitive ornaments, like some of those fl uh, scrolling flower uh, motifs that we see here. Um, craftsmen may have used slate or metal stencils. In Myanmar, most objects are gilded with small tissue thin squares of gold leaf made from 24 karat gold panned in the rivers of, the, of northern Myanmar. The earliest known example of lacquerware in Myanmar is a cylindrical teak box painted with lacquer and yellow ochre. Um, and it was uh, discovered in Bagan, which you see here on the map with the red dot, uh, in a pagoda. Um, I'm afraid I don't have a picture of a lacquer box, but um, this is an image of the pagoda. The pagoda is the Mingala Zaidi. It's the last temple to have been, <coughs> excuse me, built during the Bagan period, that is from 1044. To 1287. And um, this pagoda was sponsored by King uh, Nathathin Hapate, um, who reigned from 1256 to 1287 and became known as the Taruk Ke Min, literally the king who fled from the Taruk, the Mongols. Um, there was a, a 1287 Mongol invasion that saw the downfall of Pagan. Um, it's worth noting that the terraces of this building, uh, the Mingala Zaidi, have glazed terracotta plaques with images from Jataka tales. <clears throat> the Pagan period was Myanmar's heyday of Buddhist architecture. And the little architecture, uh, I should say, the little, little lacquer survives from the period, many fabulous works of Bagan architecture and sculpture still exist. Around 10,000 religious structures are said to have been, been built in the Bagan period between the 11th and the 13th century. It was the Kingdom of Pagan's strong connections to Sri Lanka that placed Myanmar firmly within the Ther Theravada fold. Theravada Buddhism, as many of you will know, stresses monasticism, the importance of scriptures from the Pali Canon, and merit making through good works and meditation. It's Preoccupation with merit making through acts of generous giving and self sacrifice to improve karma in future existences, with the goal of eventually 
attaining nirvana or nirvana as we uh, know it from the Sanskrit is manifest in many of the temples and monasteries. The one you're looking at right now is the Mon style Ananda temple, which is based on a cruciform plan. And this temple has been in continuous use since its Bagan period construction. <clears throat> in contrast, on the left, the Mahabodhi temple with its uh, pyramidal shaped tower was built during the reign of King Hitlominlo, 1211 to 1235 reign. This temple is modeled after the 6th central 6th century Mahabodhi temple at Bodhgaya, which marks the site in India where the Buddha achieved enlightenment. On the right hand side is a small terracotta plaque um, of dating around the 11th century uh, and now in the Walters Art Museum collection. Uh, it was a gift from the estate of Henry Gins Ginsburg to the Walters. And as you can see, it depicts the historical Buddha seated with his right hand lowered to touch the ground. Um, this is uh, his um, calling the earth to witness his defeat of the demon Mara, after which um, he becomes enlightened. So here in this detail, um, you can see that the tower that emerges above his throne, uh, as depicted on the tile, references the Mahabodhi temple in, in uh, Bodhgaya, um, which again, uh, the Mahabodhi temple in Bagan refer references in its form. <clears throat> uh, here are some other details from the plaque that I've pulled out. They are, uh, a, they are other great events in the life of the Buddha. Uh, the, uh, from left to right, uh, a monkey offering honey to the Buddha, is a, the Buddha's enlightenment, the Buddha's subduing of the rampaging elephant Nalagiri, the Buddha's death, the mir miracle at Trivasti, uh, the Buddha's first sermon at Sarnath, and the Buddha uh, being miraculously born out of his mother Maya's side. Plaques produced in large numbers at Bodhgaya were likely sold as souvenirs to pilgrims visiting the site. This type of terracotta plaque was produced at many Indian locations and the practice spread outside of South Asia along with Buddhism. So this plaque uh, from the Walters is based on a Pala model. Some Burmese examples are incised on the back with the names of royalty, but the Walters plaque only has a molded inscription as part of its Buddhist imagery. And it is a line as of yet undeciphered manuscript that likely offers the Buddhist creed. <clears throat> Plaques were generally offered by the faithful, including pilgrims as acts of merit that became sacred deposits in stupas and temples like the ones we've been looking at. And um, just a little bit later, I'm going to uh, show you uh, a, a rather unusual um, use of, of plaques um, similar to this one. <clears throat> just as Burmese architects of the Mahabodhi temple in Bagan looked to arch the architecture uh, in Bodhgaya, Burmese sculptures look to this holy place where the Buddha attained enlightenment for artistic models for Buddhist stone sculpture. And um, many finely crafted Pala period sculptures at Bodhgaya are renowned um, and Burmese sculptures found inspiration in, in these works. So um, I'm putting up here on the left-hand side, uh, an image of a stone um, uh, stele uh, from um, 
from the Pala period, from uh, around uh, Bodh Gaya, or this area anyway, um, which shows a uh, Buddha, again, mounted or seated on a throne um, at the moment of his touching the earth. And you can see that there's quite a similarity in the form with this other votive plaque, also from the Walters Connect collection here on the right-hand side, also uh, uh, molded from terracotta. And um, even uh, the uh, stupas, those uh, um, burial mounds or uh, structures above burial mounds um, that appear in the Buddhist uh, world um, are similarly depicted on the stone pala piece um, and on the, uh, the, the plaque from, um, from Myanmar. <clears throat> I wanted to compare for a moment uh, this the stone uh, piece from from Bihar. Uh, again, this um, this area of India where uh, the Buddha uh, attained enlightenment. Uh, with a Pala period stone piece, and that's the piece at the center of the photograph to the right hand side. Um, I'm afraid I don't have a more a larger close up image for you um, due to um, rights and reproductions, re reproduction issues, but I think you can see that the format um, is very, very similar. The uh, piece that uh, we're looking at on the right hand side is larger than, than the one on the left, but um, it's carved of stone. And um, many of the features of these Pala period stone carvings in, in Burma um, from Bagan are very similar to, to the, the Pala prototypes. They have very angular faces and, and features. <clears throat> um, this is a piece that uh, we selected uh, for the exhibition, The Buddhist Art of uh, Myanmar. Um, which was, uh, I think, as Ellie mentioned, in 2015. And um, after we selected, I learned that it was a popular icon with pilgrims to Bagan, and therefore the frequent recipient of visitors to the museum seeking to have their wishes fulfilled. Pilgrims can be seen in the Bagan Museum prostrating themselves before the Buddha and offering prayers in this particular Buddha. And as you can see, there are many other um, Buddha images in that gallery, but this one was singled out. A, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, as Donald Statner and Heidi Tan have written, its perceived potency came from a link to the Alodapi Pagoda in Bagan, a once neglected ancient pagoda that was renovated thanks to the patronage of Secretary One Lieutenant General Kin Yut in the 1990s. This uh, carving now in the museum is purportedly the model for a copy that has now replaced it in the Alodapi Pagoda. Um, <clears throat> Not only pilgrims believe in the efficacy of this Buddha. The museum staff gathered on the day before the packing um, of this artwork, before it was packed to fly to the exhibition in New York, um, to let the Buddha know that he would be traveling and to ask for his approval to send him on this trip. They made offerings of nine baskets of fruit, Bottles of water and a bouquet of white chrysanthemums were also left overnight as offering, offerings. And these are museum staff, um, as you can see, um, offering prayers and um, praying that uh, the, the, the Buddha will be happy um, being able to go to the United States uh, on this trip and praying that he will go there safely and return safely. Um, somehow I have a feeling that the conservation team at the Walters would look at none too favorably um, at this kind of vermin attracting offering 
appearing in, in the galleries, but um, it was seen as completely appropriate uh, in Bagan. So um, <clears throat> the next morning after this, this first offering, prayers were made and um, the, then the Bagan Museum confirmed that uh, the packing and traveling could proceed. Now, returning to the topic of votive plaques, um, here uh, you can see a map which helps you to, to locate um, the area that this site uh, I'm going to talk about uh, is, is located. Um, it is a site called the Kaogun Cave, and it's in Kayin State. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, in Lower Burma, uh, below where the current capital or the former capital of Yangon was was located. So um, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to to visit this extraordinary uh, cave uh, during one of my trips to to Myanmar. And there are over 2,000 terracotta votive tablets, uh, including three inch, three and a half inch, four inch, six inch, and eight inch um, plaques um, with the Buddha image. Uh, and these are installed uh, at the site. Um, it's also, uh, by the way, known as the Cave of the 10,000 Buddhas. I think you can see in that on that right patch there is where some of those plaques are installed, but I'm gonna show you some other images inside the cave as well. <clears throat> um, and you can see that they're installed on the natural limestone um, walls um, that measure 200 feet in height and 300 feet in length. And there are inscriptions in the cave that attest to these caves having been in use since around the seventh century, but most of the Buddhist images and inscriptions appear to date to the 15th century or later. <clears throat> um, you can see on the right-hand side that some of these are, are painted and, and gilded. So this is really, um, a very unusual site, and I, I really wanted to, to share with you this really special way that, uh, that these plaques were installed here, which is um, quite distinctive to um, the usual way uh, these, um, these plaques are offered um, uh, and then um, kept within temples or pagodas. <clears throat> So we're going to go now to Pie, uh, the red dot on the map here. Um, and I wanted to show you here another of my favorite idiosyncratic Buddhist sites in Myanmar. Um, this is the Shwemet Man Pagoda in Shedong, um, which is near Pie, uh, which used to be also known as Prome. And according to the local legend, um, in the fourth century, King Dutabong gave a pair of glasses to the main Buddha in this temple when he lost his sight. He then miraculously recovered his sight. Since then, pilgrims visit the temple and its image, often leaving spectacles as donations. You can see some of those cases where they offer spectacles as donations uh, there uh, in, in front or before the, the Buddha, some of those glass cases. Um, what you're seeing here, actually, those specs are not the uh, original ones because the original ones um, have been stolen or were stolen numerous times. Tales of the theft of efficacious objects, both mythical and factual, as we see from this case and the tale of the Buddha's hairs I mentioned earlier, are not infrequent in Myanmar. Um, and I'm going to take you now to uh, Kyokta in Rakhine, um, which was also known as Arakan, 
Um, and you probably found the name of Rakhine will probably sound familiar to you because it's been the unfortunate site of um, the terrible um, tragedies that um, have been happening to the um, Rohingya who have been um, forced to, to leave Myanmar. <clears throat> so um, in uh, Kyokta, uh, there is a famous uh, temple called the Mahamuni Temple uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that um, was constructed uh, by a queen, or rather commissioned by a queen, Sejon, and a wealthy widow uh, in Kyokta um, in Western Myanmar. And their Buddha, the main Buddha that was there, uh, became a famed uh, bronze Buddha. What I'm showing you here on the screen is not an image of that Buddha, but rather uh, two replicas of that, Bo that Buddha. However, the original adherents believed was one of the with, of only one of, was one of only five in likenesses of Shakyamuni made during his lifetime. That is the historical Buddha made during his lifetime. But more likely, it was cast at least five centuries after the Buddha's death, or as Don Statner suggests, even as late as the 14th century. Over the centuries, um, devotees have covered that original 12 foot high figure with an accumulated six inches of gold leaf. Um, and the, the sculptor, which was located uh, for hundreds of years in this temple, was captured in 1785 by the invading King Baudapaya of the kingdom of Ava. And since then, the sculpture has come to be considered the country's most sacred Buddha image. And so from 1894 until today, the original Mahamuni Buddha has remained in the Mahamuni Pagoda just south of Mandalay in central Myanmar. A copy of the original sculpture made around 1900 now takes its place at the temple uh, in Kyokta, and that's what you're seeing here on the right hand side. However, in the same temple, when you go visit it, if you go to Kyokta, and see these replicas, you will see that there's actually a smaller replica that is the focus of the attention of the devotees. And the devotees who go there to worship um, have uh, often will have gold leaf applied as an offering to that um, smaller uh, Buddha rather than the full scale model that you're seeing on the right hand side. And that's because they believe that the smaller version was actually cast from leftover metal from the casting of the one that sits in Mandalay. And therefore, they feel that this smaller one is actually more efficacious. You'll notice that um, both of these Buddhas and also the original uh, have crowns. Um, with side appendages. <clears throat> and a crowned Buddha that you, many of you, uh, will be familiar with, of course, is this large dry lacquer 19th century example um, from the Walters Art Museum. Um, the, um, these kinds of uh, appendages uh, sort of behind the ears that you're seeing are often associated with the so-called uh, Shan uh, style, uh, a, a style um, related to the Shan people who had inhabited Eastern Upper Myanmar by the 14th century. Uh, they had come from Southern China and, um, and uh, still uh, live in, in Upper Myanmar, uh, Upper Eastern Myanmar. <clears throat> the diagonal bands that you see uh, across the Buddha, uh, I'm going to go back back here uh, for just a minute, um, are a decoration of high office 
um, that was um, well known in, or common in 19th century Myanmar. Now, I'm going to uh, compare here for a moment the Walter's Indian Pala period Buddha we viewed earlier. Um, uh, just to talk a little bit about crowned and bejeweled Buddhas, um, they have long been associated with Buddhist contexts. And it seems that the crowned Buddha type became an important iconic form around the 10th century in Pala, India. So um, just a couple of centuries before this Buddha was carved on the left-hand side. The Theravada Buddha, uh, the Theravada Buddha, the Theravada Buddhist Bodhisattva concept that thrived in Myanmar relates that a Bodhisattva is one on the path to Buddhahood. Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha himself, had been a prince and it was prophesied that he would grow up to be a universal king or a Buddha. Of course, he became a Buddha. Thus, the link between royalty and the Buddha has always been present. The Buddha has been depicted as a king in his role as the universal Buddha, and rulers have promoted themselves as manifestations of Buddhas or future kings. In Myanmar, crown Buddhas often exemplify this kind of relationship between kingship and Buddhahood. They show the desire on the part of Burmese kings to utilize the connection between kingship and Buddhahood. It was a means they used to expand their power and to exert additional control by uniting state and religious issues. The popularity of crowned images, now known in Pali as Jambupati, showing the Buddha as a universal king, a Dharma Raja, proliferated in the 17th century onward in Myanmar. For example, Uangzeya, a former village chief of no royal blood, uh, who lived from 1714 to 1760, ordained himself as a Bodhisattva king, as a way of mobilizing the Burmese forces to establish the third Burmese empire and establish himself as king of all Burma. And he took the title, the great Lord who shall be Buddha one day. By the Kongbang period, when the Walters crown Buddha was created, crowned images became especially popular, perhaps due to the 1784 capture of the Mahamuni Buddha that I mentioned earlier. Now, a little bit about technique. The Walters crown Buddha is a hollow construction made from layers of red and black lacquer. The liquid lacquer was bulked with ash or rice paste and applied over a clay form. The clay form was removed after the lacquer hardened. Similar to the, similarly to the, to the chest I discussed at the start of this talk, the richly decorated surface you see was sculpted from thickened lacquer. This has been embellished with not only gold leaf, but with colored and reflective glass inlays, which you can see in the detail here. This glass inlay technique is popular in the 18th and 19th centuries um, in the Burmese art and architecture uh, and architectural tradition. The use of sacred objects to legitimize rule and sanctify the seat of government endures in the 21st century. It also continues to encourage the patronage of temples and pagodas. The Upatasanti Pagoda was donated by, uh, that's what you see here on the right-hand side, was donated by uh, Senior General Than Sui, who was born in 1933, in the uh, Myanmar capital of Naypyidaw. In light of the previous discussion of crown Buddhas in Myanmar, it's worth noting that the name Naypyida was used to refer to the royal capitals of pre-colonial kings in Myanmar and may be translated as the royal abode of the sun, royal city, or the seat of the king. The general announced the creation of the new capital, Naypyida, 
in 2002, and the new pagoda was complete, completed in 2009. The official, although the official rationale for the project was limited space in Yangon. However, there was a popular, there is a popular rumor in Myanmar that the uh, general received a prophecy from his astrologer that Yangon would fall. And for this reason, he moved the capital. The, sam the similarity between the Upatisanti Pagoda and the Shwedagon is obvious. Although the Shwedagon Pagoda is slightly larger than the Upatisanti, um, they are quite similar in form from the exterior, but actually the interiors are very different. The Shwedagon Pagoda is solid, but the Upatisanti is not. Um, it is um, hollow. And that means that worshipers can enter, circumambulate. Here's, uh, sorry, just to show you in the map, uh, there's uh, Nepi Da uh, with a red dot above Yangon. Um, worshippers can enter, circumambulate, and view relics and Buddha images within the Upatasanti, and that's what I'm showing you here on the screen. Um, <clears throat> so um, here you can see on the left-hand side there are actually um, modern-day Jataka stories that have been carved in white marble um, and placed inside in the interior of the uh, pagoda, which you can see as you're circumambulating within the pagoda. Um, they're really actually very uh, well done and quite quite beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and in addition to this, uh, these and, and other images, Tan Sui and his family are reported to have donated the Buddha tooth relic that is housed in the pagoda. Um, and it's enclosed in this case, which I uh, have a, an image of to the, to the right. Uh, it's in that, um, that larger um, uh, raised container uh, on the right-hand side. Um, so as you can see, <clears throat> a new sacred site has been established, legitimizing the new capital and the art of the Buddha in Burma endures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ani. That was quite a, an enlightening lecture. We have a little bit of time for questions from our viewers. And the first question we have is from Laura Proven. She asks, has the chest that was depicting the Jataka tales, has that chest ever been on view? She has never seen it and she thinks it would be quite interesting to see it in person. Well, the good news is that although it has not been on view to my knowledge, and uh, I think Donna, you can um, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it will be, um, uh, I believe, for the first time on view when we uh, reinstall the the Asian galleries, um, which will be quite soon. Um, hopefully in, we're aiming for now 2022, mm -hmm. uh, and it will be in uh, with all a number of other pieces that probably many of you have never seen or not seen for a long time um, in a whole new context on the fourth floor at the museum. So I have a personal question. I was blown away when I saw the votive, the votive plaques installed in that cave directly onto yes. the stone. Amazing. Yeah, do you have any idea how that was installed? I, um, I what they used to, to, um, to hold the plaques into the cave, do you mean? Yes, and I imagine some sort of scaffolding, I would imagine. Yeah, they must have, I mean, there was nothing, nothing there to show. I mean, I would assume that they probably use, use um, bamboo or some other kind of scaffolding to get up that high because because there some of them are, are really um, are, are very very high up and um, I don't I did ask at the time I'm not sure exactly what kind of a you know I, I don't think cement would have been used but some kind of cement like paste 
is used to hold the um, the the, um, the individual plaques in in place, and they even create almost kind of a the way they're installed in certain places. It looks like there's a, a program to make to create a kind of Buddhist uh, universe. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, it's a site that uh, I think still warrants a lot of future study. Yeah. Do you have plans on going back to that site anytime soon? I, I'd love to. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going anywhere anytime soon, but uh, uh, I hope sooner than later. Oh, wonderful. Well, you had also mentioned that the installation in that cave was unusual for its type. So how were votive plaques more commonly displayed in temples? Well, they actually um, are not normally displayed, but rather um, they're given as don donations. And um, sometimes when they're, um, well, for example, uh, not only in Bagan, but, but other places as well, but let me talk about Bagan a little bit because there's, there's so many temples in various states of repair in Bagan and a number of them have been kind of renovated or rebuilt in, in recent years. And they found these kinds of plaques actually sometimes embedded in the walls or um, uh, part of the, um, you know, uh, sort of the, the, among the relics that are embedded um, within or underneath um, the pagodas. Mm -hmm. So they um, they also they they kind of become part of part of the structure and the um, efficacy of the whole structure. Wonderful. I think that that in the case of the cave, because the cave itself is a kind of temple, mm -hmm. um, that's you know part of the reason the the you know the kind of exposed there on the walls of, of this cave temple. So I think that is um, all the time we have for today. We want to thank you all for tuning in to this lecture. And please hop on over to our website where you can find more digital programs. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Thank you.